The Lord is here. Let's pray. Lord, may your word be our rule and may your Holy Spirit be our teacher. And may your greater glory be our supreme concern. In Jesus' name, Amen. You know, last week I mentioned uh, how I ended up learning the Lord's Prayer. And it was at school when we had a, a daily uh, gathering for maybe half an hour. They always included the Lord's Prayer, so I ended up learning it off by heart, as I said last week. But if I was to be honest, I think growing up, there were certain bits of the Lord's Prayer that I um, thought of or meant more to me than others. So, for example, um, about forgiveness. You know, forgive forgive us our sins as we forgive those who forgive, you know, that we forgive, sorry, forgive us our sins as we forgive others that sin against us. There was that lead us not into temptation, for example. Deliver us from evil was one I remembered. But if I was to be honest, growing up, um, I wouldn't have described myself as, as, as a believer necessarily, but somehow I attached importance to this prayer, the Lord's Prayer. But the bit that maybe I didn't give too much attention to was this line, the second line of the Lord's Prayer. So we have our Father who is in heaven, who art in heaven. Holy be your name. That's today's title. The holy be your name didn't really register for me until much later on. And I'll come on to that in a moment. It needs to register for us. And one of the things that we notice, it says, holy be your name. And you wonder why it doesn't say, holy is your name. I mean, surely, if God's name is holy, it, it, it is. Why, why are we saying in a prayer, holy be your name? Why are we saying, in the same way that we say, uh, our Father who is in heaven, who art in heaven, that's an is. He's not going there, he's not on his way, he's there. Why are we saying, holy is your name? We're saying, holy be your name. And there's, there's something here where God's people believers are to make sure that God's name is holy to us and among us. There isn't any doubt about the fact that God's name is holy, of course. But we're praying, holy be your name to us as well, among us. And that's that's part of the prayer. That's our prayer. And the Lord, sorry, the, the, the world will not treat God's name is holy. We shouldn't expect the world to treat the Lord's name as holy. But God's people are... If, who else is going to do it if it's not God's people? And it's for those who love and follow the Lord to make sure his name is treated as the holy name it is. There's nothing casual, is there, about the name of the Lord our God. In fact, Scripture warns us, be careful how we use God's name. Now, you may or may not have thought about it. You know, when you think about the Ten Commandments, we tend to think of, do not murder. We might think of, do not steal. We might think of, do not commit adultery. Uh, Not have any graven images. Don't worship anything else other than the Lord thy God. But we may not think of one of the Ten Commandments being this comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Wow. One of the top ten. There it is. Misusing the Lord's name is one of the top. Well, it's in the Ten Commandments. You know, when you and I were at school, perhaps, I don't know about you, but, you know, perhaps you were called names. Everyone was calling each other names. Some people can be very cruel at school. But if somebody spoke badly about your mum or your dad, I don't know about you, but somehow it felt far worse when they were really dissing your mum or your dad. 
And you reacted differently. You might not have defended yourself quite so much when you were called names, but if, you, if they had something to say about your mum or dad, you rose up in indignation to defend. And you know, when we belong to God as our Father, by his grace, his name matters to us, doesn't it? And we lead by example by treating his name as holy. We, we're the ones that show the example of God's name is holy. And his name is holy because, of course, God is holy. When I was at, at school, uh, I wouldn't have described myself as a believer. I told you I knew the Lord's Prayer from an early age, but I was about 17, 18. It was chemistry higher, or ALA was as we used to call them. And my chemistry teacher, Mr. Broyd, um, he was quite strict, but he was a fair teacher. Um, every now and again, he might throw the chalk at somebody, but it, wasn't, it didn't get much worse than that. He stern voice. But I had developed a habit of blaspheming God's name. So for me, it was not a big deal. So when I said the words Jesus Christ, I didn't say it out of reverence. I didn't say it as part of a prayer. I would use it as an exclamation. For me, that's what I, that, 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 that was part of my everyday language. I didn't think anything of it. And in his class, you know, if something happened, an experiment that we were doing in chemistry, something else, I would exclaim. And, and, other, and, and other names of God as well. And one day, he said, right, the lesson's finished, the bell went. He said, Chris, can you <coughs> stay behind for a minute, please? And we all knew often that we were in trouble when that happened. So I said, what is it, sir? He goes to me, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, and then some of my friends wanted to linger. He said, no, you can go. I just want Chris. And uh, he sat me down. I was expecting, I, was, I wasn't sure what I'd done. I didn't even think about this at all. I, mean, I said, what is it, sir? And uh, he said, um, you know when you use God's name in vain? I'd never heard that expression before. I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, well, you're using God's name, Jesus, Jesus Christ, and God, um, in, in vain. You're, and I was trying to understand what he meant. And uh, I said, sir, I'm not saying anything negative about him, about God. He said, no, you're not. He says, but it's not like any other name, Chris. I said, okay. And he said, it, it's holy. He said, it, it, it's not a common name. You can't just... I said, but, and I tried to be clever. I said, but sir, it's not against the school rules. <laughs> and he said, I know it's not against the school rules. He said, then he said to me, but for me, if you don't mind, d don't do it. So I was, I was kind of convicted a bit, and I felt a bit awkward about it. I said, right, so I'll try. I'll try, I'll, I'll try my best. And I didn't do very well with it, but I did try, and it was less than I, I used to. And that was my first inkling, that actually it was possible to misuse God's name. But I, I still didn't fully get it. Fast forward three, maybe four years. I'm at college, I'm studying and I'm speaking to someone who I know she's a Christian, a girl called Juliet. And I'm chatting to her. She's the girlfriend of my, my next door neighbour, Bim. And I just blaspheme in the, in, the, in the course of conversation. And then immediately I remembered Mr. Broyd. I said, oops. I said, Juliet, I'm sorry. I said, I, I shouldn't have said that. And her response surprised me. She said to me, Chris, uh, don't apologise for me, she said, which is what I thought was required because of Mr. Broyd. She said, it's not for my benefit, she said. It's for yours. 
Now, I, I said, how do you mean? She goes, well, God's name is holy. And so w- when you use it in the way you're using it, it's, it's for your sake, not for mine. And I suddenly realised that actually, Mr. Broid's sake, yeah, he did ask me, he said, do it for me. But actually there was Juliet saying, do it for yourself, do it for him. And whether I was a believer or not, and I wasn't at the time, she was basically saying, it matters. It matters to you. You know, knowing God's name is holy gives us a certain perspective. And if, if, just humor me for a minute, because I'm sure many of you know what I mean by perspective. But when we were in California with Julie, there was this great big California redwood trees that were just too tall for us to imagine. They just disappeared into the sky. And I wanted to take a picture to take back home and show people how big these trees were. So I said, Julie, if you don't mind, can you just stand in front of that tree? And I'll go. So I went further and further back so that she was really small. And the tree, just so when I took the photograph and took it back home, people could have some perspective. These trees are big. It's not. Otherwise, if I just took the tree on its own, it just looks like a, a, a tree, doesn't it? Sometimes we need a comparison. We need perspective. And so if you were to ask somebody and play a game and you said, look, think of someone in your mind and I'll ask you questions and I'll try to guess how big or small they are. And you might start with, is the person smaller than you? And no, you say, uh, they're not. Is the person bigger than you, you ask? They ask. And you say, yeah, they're bigger than me. Uh, Are they taller than six foot? Yes. Bigger than six foot five? Yes. Wow, not bigger than seven foot. And you say, yep, bigger than seven foot. And the person keeps guessing. Bigger than a double-decker bus? And you say, yes. Bigger than the tallest tree? Yes, you say. Bigger than a mountain, they say. And you keep saying yes. And eventually you say, look, this person is so big that he made the mountains. He put the stars and the planets in space. And his love reaches from the earth to the heavens. And suddenly the other person has perspective. This person you're talking about isn't just a little, it's not an inch or two taller than you. He's so much bigger than we can ever imagine and no one can compare with him. Now, holiness is not the same as size or stature, of course. Holiness means, amongst other things, goodness. Purity. And when scripture says that God is the Holy One, it means that there is no evil in him. There is nothing bad in him. Everything he does is good. With us, in perspective, there's no comparison. What we call good. And the Apostle Paul writes to the Roman church, the church in Rome, he says, For I know, he says, that nothing good lives in me. Apostle Paul saying that. I know that nothing good lives in me. That's in my flesh, he said. And Jesus says in the Gospel of Mark, he says, No one is good except God alone. And King David says, I say to the Lord, he says, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing apart from you. You're the only good thing that I have. And of course, the well-known scripture that I've often quoted, we know well, the Apostle Paul writing again to the church in Rome, chapter 3 says, all of us have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. Now, you know that the word for sin in the original Greek language of the New Testament and the scriptures is still in use today. The same word. We would use it on on the streets of Greece and Cyprus. And it means the same thing as well today. And that word for sin is amartia. And long before I came to the Lord, I knew this word, amartia. And it literally means missing 
the mark. And what the scripture says is that we've all missed the mark. And that's why we come to Christ. We're acknowledging our need of the sinless man who was also and is also fully God. Who represents us. Who represents human beings like us. Our bridge, if you like, with God. The Holy One. And when Paul's writing to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 2, he says, For there is one God, and there's one mediator between God and mankind. The man, Christ Jesus. He's our mediator, but he's the Holy One. And when we don't understand that God's name is holy, that God is holy, we lose our standard of measurement. We lose our ruler with which we measure, if you like. When we don't understand that God is holy, it's like losing north on your compass. We are lost very quickly as a result and we cannot find our way home. When we don't accept that God is holy, it literally is like a ship that has lost its anchor. It will drift further and further out to sea or eventually be smashed on the rocks. If we forget that God is holy, we have no standard for holy living. And we make it up as a society as, as we go along. Or as individuals, we just do whatever we, we think is right. And what a disaster that is. You know, we might make the person that we admire on TV our standard. We think, well, if she's saying it, 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 should, be, it should be good. If he's saying it, if he's doing it, it should be okay. It should be right. Or one of our friends that we admire. Or we might make the latest best-selling book our advice. That's where we take our cue from. And we do that sometimes rather than listening to the, the book. God's book, God's scriptures, the word, God's word, and what they're telling us. And what are the scriptures telling us? They're telling us that God is holy. He is the Holy One. He is our standard. And God says, be holy as I am holy. That's Peter, the, the ex-fisherman, writing in 1 Peter chapter 1. Be holy as I am holy. I'll come back to that a bit later on. You know, a society that loses its standard of holiness which is the Lord, loses its ability to measure itself. And it will become unholy very, very quickly. The scripture is full of societies and kingdoms that actually, when they were holding the Lord aloft as their standard of holiness, prospered. When they forgot him and his standard of holiness, the society degenerated. It became unholy very, very quickly. It doesn't take long. And it doesn't take long before people start doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. Because no one knows anymore where where north is. There's no anchor. And right and wrong is adrift. So when we come in prayer and say, holy be your name, we're reminded of our own condition without Christ. It's a reminder to confess our sin before God. So we say, holy be your name. Immediately, it's a reminder. Am I holy? No, I'm not. I need to confess anything, anything that needs to be confessed. We say, holy be your name because it's the truth. But we also say it out of gratitude. And what do I mean by that? Is God has forgiven our sins through Christ's holiness, not our own holiness, for those who believe. And we're grateful for that. 
And I'm going to take you to the, the shores of the Lake of Galilee. Peter comes face to face with Jesus Christ. The fisherman Peter. Peter's on his boat and he recognised the holiness of this man standing before him, Jesus. He felt uncomfortable. We too can feel uncomfortable sometimes before God because, because he's holy and we're not. What did Peter say to Jesus? It says here, this is Luke, the doctor, the physician, chapter 5, verse 8. Peter said this to Jesus. He fell at Jesus' knees. It's an interesting description there. Normally you fall on your knees. Several translations have got it. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. You know, Peter may have thought he was a good man until he met Jesus. The man without sin. The Holy One. And sometimes we only, we only realise what is what when we actually come across the real thing. And Peter may have thought, I'm a good man, as good as any of my friends. I work hard, I provide for my family. I'm a good husband, I think. I'm a good father. I'm definitely better than, than that man across the street that's now in jail. And then he met Jesus. And all of a sudden, Peter didn't feel like he was a good man anymore. And he says, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Go away from me. And what did Jesus say? Did he say, you're right. I can't stay around a sinful man like you. I need to go. Is that what he said? No. Jesus came for a man like Peter. Peter. And he came for a man and a woman like you and me. That's who he came for. Jesus sees that Peter has recognised his condition. That he's a sinful man and he calls him to action. He says, come, follow me. Notice that Peter's already said, Lord. He believes. And he recognises his condition. Do you know, a big obstacle to coming to Christ is not recognising our condition. Peter recognised his condition. And the Lord can't save us if we don't admit, confess our condition. If we're just holding on to what we think we're a good person. No, I think I'm, 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 a, I think I'm good. Look at, look at him. Because our standard of holiness is the person next to us, across the street, the person we work with. The second big obstacle to come into Christ is then not being willing to pay the price for following him. Peter got up and went. You know, some people want Christ, but they don't want to carry their cross to follow him. And yet it was Christ, of course, as we know, who paid the ultimate price on our behalf for our sins by giving his life that he lived with holiness. And there's the promise that the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just. Just means fair. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And then it says this. And to cleanse us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It all starts with if we confess our sins. You know, when we look at Jesus' holiness, as I was preparing, it reminded me of an advert which you may remember better than me, perhaps. I think it was Purcell, the washing up powder for clothes. And, but others have claimed it too. But the claim was to get our clothes, our whites, whiter than any other detergent. Do you remember that? And before these modern washing detergents, everyone's white clothes started to look grey over time with much washing. And the advert on television 
told us that our whites would become a brilliant, a brilliant white. That was what they used. We could even achieve, quote, a bluey whiteness, whatever that means. But who can wash us in a fundamental sense? Only God can do that. Wash me, says King David. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. He knows he can't do it himself. He says, wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow when you do it. Psalm 51, verse 7. And then Isaiah the prophet quotes the words of the Lord, speaks the words of the Lord, should I say, Come now, says the Lord, let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, and scarlet is a bright, bright red colour, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, because he does it. So God cleanses us. We don't have to keep confessing sins that we have already been forgiven for, that we've genuinely confessed. We don't need to keep going back there. We are cleansed from them. It's over. We don't have to keep questioning God's forgiveness of sins that we've already confessed. If we confess our sins, he's faithful. And he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what it says. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Finished. If you're a Christ follower, you don't have to keep going back there and stay stuck. The enemy would like you to. But the Lord has dealt with it. It's done. It's washed whiter than snow. It's cleansed us from all, trans- all unrighteousness. So when we come to pray, holy be your name, we're not praying as unrighteous people. We're praying as adopted sons and daughters who stand in Christ's righteousness. And his clothes are a brilliant white. But we're standing in him. And it's because of Christ's holiness that we can stand before God. Cleansed from all unrighteousness, we said. Jesus said to his disciples, this is John 13, he says, Those who have had a bath, he says, this is to the disciples, Those who have had a bath, he says, only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, he says. And he says to the disciples, and you are clean. And then he says, though not every one of you, because obviously Judas was going to betray Jesus. And what that means for us is that when we've come to Christ, we've confessed, we've received the Holy Spirit, we've been baptised, we've been washed, clean, from, we've confessed our sins. If it's genuine confession, the Lord is just. He forgives. We've had a bath. Those who've had a bath, he says, only need to wash their feet. If the feet get dirty, you wash the feet. You don't wash the whole thing again. And for us, it means that we don't have to keep going and redoing the whole thing as if we're starting from scratch again. But we do keep short accounts with the Lord. If it's a week, it's a bit too long. Make it, make it short. Let's keep our account short with the Lord if we, if we stray. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, he says, Be holy as I am holy. I said I would come back to that. You know, uh, when we pray, holy be your name, we need to remember that the, the Lord has called us to be holy. He has given us his spirit which changes us more and more into Christ likeness as we submit to him. It's a call not to live the old life anymore. We pray, holy be your name. And the Lord says, you know, we say, holy be your name. And the Lord says, be holy as I am holy. We've received Christ. And that means we are being changed. Now, it's tempting to say, uh, holy be your name. Oh, good. God is holy. I'm not. So, done. Isn't it? Because we keep saying God is holy and we're not. And it's easy to say 
Lord, you're the Holy One. I confess and I can walk away. But that's not what the Lord is saying. The Lord says, come as you are. But he also says, don't stay as you are. It's not an excuse to stay as we are, is it? Because the call is to us as saints. And he says, be holy as I am holy. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, without holiness, it says, no one will see God. Without holiness, no one will see God. When people look at us imperfect as we are, there should be something in us, something about us that points away from us to him. To points, they look at us, but they see above. Our Father in heaven, whose name is holy, holy be your name. Let's pray. Father, I pray that if there's anything, Lord, that we keep revisiting when we don't have to, show it to us, Lord, this morning. And help us to find our rest and peace with you. That it's done. It's over. You've cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help us not to revisit the old. Help us to look ahead, Lord, to press forward to what is to come. Lord, help us to keep short accounts with you. Help us to be mindful that your name is holy. Help us, Lord, to not be tempted to misuse it. And Lord, I pray that we will answer that call for ourselves and for our families to not just stay as we are after we've come to you, but to allow your Holy Spirit in us to change us that we may grow in the likeness of Christ, as the scripture says, day by day, week on week, month on month and year by year, Lord. May we let you change us into your likeness, Lord, as we submit to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.